In some of my most recent videos, I've said multiple times that many people don't truly understand the gospel. Most people don't truly recognize the one true God, Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Most people do not recognize his begotten son, Yahshua HaMashiach, whom he sent to die for our sins, who rose again on the third day conquering death, allowing us to receive eternal life and be redeemed to our Father. Today, because we are fast approaching the time where Satan will be worshipped by the world, many are deceived believing that they are worshipping the God of Israel, our true creator, but are actually worshipping Satan, a rebellious, created being. And because Satan is the author of confusion, many people just don't understand the true faith. We see the fake churches, the false pastors, the false proclaimers of the gospel, the false Christian entertainers, the false doctrines, false denominations. And for many, all they can see is confusion and falseness. And when you have something so important that is masqueraded and hidden from us because of false gatekeepers used to draw us away from our belief and relationship with our father, it's easy to believe it's either all fake or no one has the truth. And you should just focus on being a good person and everything else will fall in place. I mean, I get it. That's why people are the way they are today. Kanye actually summed up what many people feel. That's the gospel. Don't be telling me Mormons got an extra book and Catholics do that. It's simple. Christians, we be making it too hard for people to come and be involved in this. You hear how they all clap for it? That's because there is a one world religion that is coming, that is preaching acceptance and tolerance of all, as long as you are not accepting and intolerant to the doctrine of the one true God, Yahweh. I've made a series called The History of Religion that will walk you through paganism, then on to understanding the God of Israel, then understanding the Messiah whom he prophesied of, and then we walk through his life, death, resurrection, and then the beginning of the church. Then after that, we go into the beginning of the lies, from Constantine and the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church to Islam and Jehovah Witnesses. But that series is very in-depth, and many may not be ready for it, because a ground level understanding still needs to be understood. So what I want to do is provide a ground floor understanding to why you should believe in Yahshua HaMashiach, in English tongue transliterated to Jesus Christ. I want you to understand why you must submit to the one God of Israel and make his will your priority. If you don't understand fully why you should believe in the Jesus of the Bible, it's going to be broken down to you today. Let's begin. So, to understand this, we need to start at the beginning. So here is the starting point of our faith. Now to be clear, this is a very condensed explanation. If you have other questions, I hopefully have made a video covering this subject, and I will place a video recommendation list to gain more in-depth understanding in the description box. But this is the starting point. We start at creation. You can find this in the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 through 3. This understanding does not include this Big Bang Theory, evolution, monkeys turning into men, or dinosaurs. This is a biblical understanding. We start with God creating the heavens and the earth, all living things, and of course man and woman. Genesis directly handles how our relationship started with Yahweh. Adam and Eve were in a pure union with our Creator. In the garden, our father walked amongst them. As Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 said, And they heard the sound of Yahweh, Elohim, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh, Elohim, among the trees of the garden. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17, he told Adam, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And this is an important point to understand, the concept of death. So let's first understand that Adam did disobey Yahweh's command, and from the temptation from his wife, he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now when Yahweh confronted him on this, Adam did not immediately die. He was reprimanded severely. But the death he was told of did not happen in the way that we would have thought. I mean, Genesis chapter 5, verse 5 says, Adam lived for 930 years. Did God's word come back void? Of course not. The story of Adam and Eve is important 
because it goes into the difference in our relationship with him. We started in communion with him. We knew him intimately. Adam had direct access to him. But when he sinned, he received the penalty of death. But it was not a physical death. It was a spiritual death in which we were no longer in communion with him. We were no longer walking in a personal relationship with him. We did not have direct access to him. And this was Satan's goal, to corrupt God's creation, to take away our union with Yahweh and bring us under his rule. He wants to be like the Most High. But Yahweh gave the first prophecy of the Bible to Satan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And this is the whole setup of the world that we are in today. So this is the starting point. We will describe it as man living in direct communion and relationship with our creator. The next point we will label as man's temptation into sin. Then the next point is death of man. But again, our death is our disconnection from Yahweh. We are no longer in a direct relationship with him. And then the next point is the prophecy of the solution. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. These are all important points to understand from the beginning. Now to understand more about the story of creation, you should read it for yourself in Genesis chapter 1 through 3. But I also made a video called Born in Sin where I speak about this a little more in depth. Please check it out. Now, after this, man began to multiply on the earth. And according to Genesis chapter 6, the fallen angels began to take wives of the daughters of men and have children with them. And the world grew in wickedness. But Noah found favor and grace in the eyes of Yahweh. His bloodline was not mixed with the DNA of the fallen angels. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 says that he was perfect in his generations, meaning his bloodline was not contaminated. And Yahweh saved Noah and his family when he flooded the earth and destroyed all living things that were not in the ark. And after the flood, the nations of the world started from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So on this point on the timeline, we show that the nations of the earth stem from the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now it's important to recognize that all of man is still on the same line. We are all still separate from God. He dealt with individuals he chose, but it was not by personal choice. So now the world empire started to form. The first world empire starts from Nimrod and his mother slash wife, Semiramis. And from them, the pagan religions of the world stem from. The polytheistic multi-god belief in father god, mother god, and son of god started in Mesopotamia. And this polytheistic belief goes throughout the rest of the world empires. On to Egypt, then Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, then Rome. From this polytheistic belief is where you will find the confusion that we are plagued with today. This is where the misunderstanding comes from that the Jesus of the Bible is the same as the Tammuz of Mesopotamia, the Horus of Egypt, or the Apollo of Greece. I speak about this more in depth in part one of the History of Religion series. Please watch so you can gather more understanding. So on this point in the timeline, we will label this the first Babylon and the beginning of paganism and satanic worship. Now, again, all of man are still moving together in this timeline in a separation from Yahweh. Now, Nimrod and the empire of Egypt all stem from the bloodline of Ham, and the empires of Greece and Rome stem from the bloodlines of Japheth. For more understanding, please watch the history of racism and nations. But from the bloodline of Shem, we are introduced to Abraham. Abraham was proven faithful to Yahweh, and he is then given a covenant with Yahweh. Part of that covenant we will find in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, through Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this is a direct prophecy of Yahshua the Messiah, who will bless the whole world. Many people today who want to say that Jesus is only for them, love to ignore this prophecy. But this covenant was made with Abraham 
so the world can be blessed. And through this covenant, Yahweh was still working to fulfill his prophecy made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So in this part of the timeline, we will label this as the covenant made with Abraham. Yahweh using him and his line to bless all the families of the earth. Now, the covenant goes through Abraham's son, Isaac, and then to Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and Yahweh renames him Israel in Genesis chapter 32. The sons of Israel are made separate tribes, and they move to Egypt. They grow in number, and then are enslaved. Now, on the timeline, we will reference this as the establishment of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yahweh uses Moses to free the tribes of Israel from Egypt, and shows himself to the world for the first time since he confused the languages at Babel. This was at the time that we know today as Passover, a great and prophetic time in the history of the earth where Yahweh passed over the children of Israel who put the blood of a slain lamb over their doorpost and killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt he executed judgment. The blood of the lamb was a sign that he will pass over Israel and the plague should not be on Israel when he struck Egypt. And his day should be remembered forever. This is found in Exodus chapter 12. We will mark this on the timeline as the Passover. These are all important. Now after Yahweh frees Israel from bondage in Egypt, he promises to establish them as his chosen people and keep the covenant that he made with their father Abraham. It is at this time where he gives them laws and statutes in which we know today as the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses, or Torah. This is all spoken about in part two of the History of Religion series. In regards to the law, they were required to keep this law, and he will bless them abundantly. If they did not keep it, then they would be cursed. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. I have made a video about this as well. Now, in reading the Bible from about Exodus chapter 20, then the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you will find a lot about the law of Moses that they were required to follow. And from this law, we now know what sin is. We will mark this on the timeline, but we need to make a slight change. You see, before this point, man was all together, walking separate from Yahweh. But when Yahweh reestablished his covenant with Israel after he freed them from Egypt and gave them his law, they were now in a covenant with our Creator. They were the only nation on earth to worship one God. The rest of the known world and the empires that came after in the ancient world all worshipped many gods. They are polytheistic. Now, you may get thrown off because of the claims that Egypt worshipped one God at one point in time. This was through the pharaoh Akhenaten, and this was shortly lived. His movement was destroyed after his death, and it was proven to be heretical as it was not believing and a different god, the Akhenaten, as the one god. To Egypt, he was a heretic. This is quite different and only used to provide confusion. But like I was saying, Israel was the only nation to worship one god, and now they are separated on the timeline. It's Israel and the other nations, which are Gentiles. Now, they were still separate from Yahweh in regards to the spiritual death stemming from Adam, but they were Yahweh's chosen people, chosen because they were used to carry out the covenant that Yahweh established with Abraham. And they were chosen to make the one true God of the world known to all nations. He chose a very small nation and made them victorious over many larger opponents like Egypt and those who occupied the land that they were promised. So in this timeline, we will draw out another line from this and mark this as the establishment of Israel. Now, the Old Testament is filled with their history. It's pretty much an extraordinary history book of the children of Israel. There is history, doctrine, and prophecy all combined. If you watch parts 3 through 12 of the History of Religion series, their history will be explained more in depth. So at this point, the timeline will move together. We have the Gentile nations, which is everyone except Israel, and then we have Israel. Their timelines will move together at the same time, but they are still separate. Yahweh is working through Israel, establishing his covenant to bless the whole world. We will label this point in the timeline only on the timeline of Israel. This is the birth of the promised Messiah, our Redeemer, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ.
And this is where we see the covenant of Abraham fulfilled. This is something that must be understood in its entirety. And this one video cannot give it the full attention needed. You should read the Gospels on your own. That's the book of John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I also go over this in depth from parts 13 to part 43 in the History of Religion series. In this, the full Gospel will be presented to you. You must understand Yahshua's words and his commands. But in the end, he died, and three days later, he is resurrected. And from this, the covenant made with Abraham is completed, and we can now bring the two timelines back together, because now all a man is now able to take part of the covenant with Yahweh. So let's bring the two timelines together and mark it as Abrahamic covenant fulfilled. Now, I hope that you're able to follow this so far. Now that the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled, there is now another separation. Now, let me be clear that just because I brought Israel back into the timeline does not mean that Yahweh is done with them. He still has reserved them for himself. And as we see in the book of Revelation, he seals 144,000 of them, 12,000 from each tribe, excluding Dan. But the timeline is connected now because all men are now able to be blessed by the sacrifice of Yahshua and him conquering death. And now there is a separation. There is the world and there is the assembly, the followers of the way, the church. And these timelines are running parallel to each other. As time goes, the church desires to bring more of the world in on their timeline. And the world, which is run by Satan, is trying to get the church to join in on his. The thing is that in some point, the timeline with the world is going to stop, but the timeline of the church will go on forever. Now, before I bring it all into these modern days, let's bring some clarity. If you go back to the beginning of our creation, we were in union with Yahweh. But because of Adam's sin, we had a spiritual death. We were no longer in union with Yahweh. After Yahshua, this all has changed. And this is why you must believe in him and surrender. This is completely a wonderful thing. So let me just try to take a few minutes to try and break it down. When Yahshua was on earth, he said this in John chapter 3, verse 3. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Elohim. See, so we must be born again. But again, it's not our physical lives. We are not going to be reborn physically. This is a spiritual thing. Our spirits are reborn. Remember, because of Adam, we are dead. Not us physically, but us spiritually. Now, because of Yahshua, we are able to be born again and receive eternal life. Verse 15 of John chapter 3 says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, what is eternal life? Yahshua tells us in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you, as you have given him all authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yahshua HaMashiach, whom you have sent. So understand, eternal life is the opposite of the death that we received from Adam. You should read the complete chapter of Romans chapter 5 that explains this very well. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And then verse 18 and 19 then says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Like I said, eternal life is the opposite of the death Adam received and passed on to us all. Through his death, we were not in union with our Creator. But through Yahshua, the Son of Man, the last Adam, we are now able to be born again and have life. Our spirits are reborn and we are now able to know our Creator. We are able to be in union with Him. 
This is a free, awesome gift that we are given this when we believe and are baptized. Now, how does this union take place? This is another part that is not understood. When Israel was in their history before Yahshua, they heard from Yahweh through prophets that spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was in the midst of Israel, but he was not given freely to them individually. He did not dwell within them individually. Before Yahshua died and resurrected, he made promises about the Holy Spirit and said this in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You understand? The Holy Spirit is our helper that brings us our union with our Father. He dwells in us when we are born again, and that's what gives us our eternal life. And that's what makes us a part of the assembly. We literally are in union with our Creator and can now have Him guide us directly. I mean, when you actually understand this, it is so wonderful, and we should all praise Him and be extremely thankful for this. So because of Yahshua, we have a direct relationship with our Father that we do not need man to be an intermediary through. You do not need to go through man to gain access to our Father. And through this relationship, when we place our trust in Him and surrender to His will, He provides all the goodness and content that our hearts desire. We are given a peace that passes all understanding. And so our belief in Yahshua, Jesus Christ, allows us to be redeemed from the sin of Adam and gives us a union and relationship with our Father. We are able to be led by him and walk with him, and that is truly amazing. I have a video that discusses the Holy Spirit. Please watch it to gain more understanding. Now, this is not to discount that in the end, on the day of final judgment, when all the world is judged, our only way of redemption is being alive in Yahshua, having his Holy Spirit and being born again. And that's why the timeline of the church continues while the timeline of the world stops. There's no way of stressing the very importance of this. But while we are alive here on earth, we should strive to be in union and fellowship with our creator. And we should be thankful for the grace that he's provided that even allows this to be possible. When we choose to ignore this and take this for granted, it literally is the worst mistake that we could ever make. So why wouldn't we want to be in union with our creator? I don't imagine that the majority of people today knowingly have said they do not want this. So as we move in the timeline and we have the church and the world moving parallel to each other, you have massive points in history where the devil jumps in and adds confusion. We see Constantine and the start of the Roman Catholic Church, which is just a twist of the ancient pagan mystery religions, while adding a repackaged Jesus that adds confusion. We see wars and control that all stem from the Roman Catholic Church conquering the world in the name of God. Only, it's not truly in the name of Yahweh, but of Lucifer. We then have the rise of Islam, another attempt by Satan to create a religion tied into one God, drawing confusion. And then we have many atrocities done in the world, all done by people that confess a belief in the Jesus of the Bible. And when we jumble all of that up and package it up, if you are ignorant of the Bible and emotionally disconnected from the truth because of the many lies that have been presented to you, you will unknowingly reject the greatest gift you could ever be given. You are able to be one with our creator and be led by him personally. You can have a wonderful relationship with him that brings you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You have someone you can always trust and depend on. You do not need to be taken advantage of by this wicked world system. You can be free from bondage. You have power over the dark forces that seek to come against you. You have power and you are redeemed. And what Satan has tried to do is draw that line as close to him as possible and blur the lines, combining the church with the world. So now what we have is more like three lines. There is the church, there is the world, and then there is a mixture of the two. Only one of these lines will be accepted and have the power and the peace and all those other fruits that I've mentioned. But you may be deceived because of the middle line. There is no mixing. 
And though you may be seeing a great deal of professing Christians that claim love for Jesus, but are also hypocrites, please understand that that does not represent the true faith. So from all this explanation, what you have been walked through is the reason why we need Yahshua. When you hear that the wages of sin are death, now you know that this is not about a physical death, but worse, a spiritual death that has taken us out of fellowship with our Father. And when we engage in sin, we are bringing in separation from Him. Believing in Yahshua the Messiah, the Son of Elohim, is not just so that we can go to heaven. But don't get me wrong, that's a huge big deal. But it's also so that we can live out the purpose that we were created for, which is to worship our Creator and be in fellowship and union with Him. When we live out our purpose that we are created for, you can understand why we have all those wonderful gifts like love, joy, and peace that passes all understanding. You understand more why we can go through tribulation and still have peace. I want you to understand why you need our Savior and why you should submit to Him. I want you to understand why He is so important to us and why the devil doesn't want you to understand this. The devil does not want us in union with our Father. He wants us to worship Him because He wants to be like the Most High. So he is aggressively attacking this faith to draw confusion and mix himself into it so that in the future we are worshiping him, thinking that we are worshiping the Most High. And we are almost at the climax where this will be a reality. The only way for you to be free from the bondage and deception is for you to walk in union with our Father, to repent from your sins, be baptized in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and surrender to the will of our Father. Stop living a selfishly led life that will keep you separate from our Creator and in the end cast you into the lake of fire. Life is not about doing what you want. It's about doing what our Father wants. And it's time that you make a decision to serve Him today. It's not too late for you, but it does require sacrifice. Put away the old man or woman and become a new creation. Stop worrying about fulfilling your flesh and start desiring to be led by His Spirit. Learn more about him. Read his word. Talk with him in prayer. Gain more discernment by understanding more about him. Let him use you for what you were created for and live a wonderful life in fellowship with our creator, the most high, the one true God of Israel, the great I am, Yahweh. I sincerely desire this for you, and I hope that this video sparks a desire for you to learn more about him. Read your Bibles, and for more of an in-depth understanding, Please watch the videos that are listed in the description box and just watch the History of Religion series in its entirety. I placed a link to the timeline in the description box as well. Decide who you are going to serve. Is it going to be the God of this world, a created being, or the God of all creation, the Most High, the Great I Am? You cannot serve both. You now understand why you must believe in Jesus and become born again. What will you do about it? The choice is yours. Be blessed. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, don't forget to like it and share it with others. I hope this video provides more clarity. Share this with whoever you think needs to hear it. If you have not already done so, do not forget to subscribe to this channel and watch the History of Religion series. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram. I also would like to sincerely thank all those who support this ministry. I'm very grateful for your love and support. You truly make a difference in this ministry and assist me greatly with putting together these messages. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being a blessing. Okay, everyone. Thanks again for watching. I love you all.